every year I put together some, uh, some notes from some things I've been working on and that may be of interest to you. So um, we'll get started with uh, the afternoon sessions here. So as I, uh, I mentioned this morning, this is uh, the 13th year for Contest University. And of course, uh, ICOM has been a supporter for all 13 years. Worldwide, over 7,000 students have attended a Contest University. And so uh, we're continuing to, to go on and on and on here. Uh, the CTU live stream, Ken, is up here today. He's also no known on Facebook as Digital Dorsey. If you ever tune into DX Engineering on Thursdays, uh, Ken will teach you anything that you can imagine about uh, digital radio. We do have uh, very nice strategic partnerships with the Northern California DX Foundation and also with YASME. And uh, Ward is the uh, president of YASME, and I appreciate uh, his support here at Contest University. And I ask that you support the vendors that support this great um, CTU by uh, showing them um, that you enjoy what's going on here because we wouldn't be able to hold the pricing where it is without all the support that we get. Um, the, the recorded sessions of Contest University will be available in a few weeks on the web. Um, there's probably five years worth of those presentations that have been recorded and the slide decks are up there. Share them with your clubs, share them with other fellow hams, uh, that's what they're there for. And of course the uh, contesting terminology uh, in the back of the book was updated for 2019. So let's talk about some station ideas. If you come to K3LR you will see this is a, um, a feed point of one of my OWA Yaggies and you'll notice that the bead ballon is now mounted about three and a half inches away from the boom because I discovered um, a few years ago that by putting that ferrite choke, which goes right to the feed point, an optimized uh, wideband array, Yagi, has a 50 ohm feed point, and so all it needs is a current choke right at the feed point to make sure that the feed line does not get involved in becoming an antenna. That choke, its common mode impedance is affected by being up against the boom. Simply by moving it three and a half inches away, you get back a lot of the common mode impedance that you gave away by having it on the boom. So we built these little fiberglass standoffs to do that. When you're feeding these things, if you look at the feed point um, right here, you'll notice that there's a little black box there. And that black box transitions from uh, PL259 to the actual feed point of the Yagi itself. And so um, we decided to productize that. It's known as the feed point connector. Uh, Greg Ordy, W8WWV, came up with that. And we make it in three different styles now. It makes it a very nice transition to go to any kind of an antenna that you would normally you know, make a, an SO239 connection to. This is a, uh, a, one of uh, several different current chokes that I use at K3LR. This happens to be the Comtex CFC50. It has uh, over 5,000 ohms of common mode impedance on 160 meters through 10 meters, so it's very, very good for the application of feeding Yaggies and dipoles. Um, this, this particular uh, current choke comes as a kit uh, these are number 31 beads. If you're buying ferrite from DX Engineering, it's color-coded. How many times have you bought ferrite from somebody and you had no idea after you opened the box whether it was a number 31, a number 43, a number 61, but they're color-coded at DX Engineering. And this is one of my favorite uh, current chokes. It's got 40 beads in it, and uh, th that works very well because these beads go over RG213 or over uh, 400 max, and it makes a very effective choke so you don't have to have a barrel in between the Comtex CFC50. And uh, so, and I'm gonna talk about the effect of this particular choke on feed lines that are on your tower here in a minute. There's also, this is the, uh, the YCCC current choke that is used, uh, that they published and the DX engineering carried for some time. It's a very easy choke. 
that was built by W1FV and has uh, thousands of ohms of common mode impedance. It's great for uh, 75 ohm systems, uh, receiving systems, or even 50 ohms. Just depends, uh, the impedance just dep is dependent on what feed line you use to actually wind the choke. At DX Engineering, we make a, uh, another choke that you can put into the RG6 lines to keep them from becoming antennas. That is one of the biggest single gains I've had at K3LR over the years is I've added more ferrite and more chokes to keep control wires and to keep coax and uh, hardline from becoming antennas. And uh, that can really disturb the performance of your receiving systems. Um, here's a line isolator that we make. This is very effective. I basically have a line isolator at every feed point of every antenna and also one down in the shack right where it goes into the amplifier or antenna switch to try and isolate all those potential points of pickup. I don't want that feed line to be picking anything up and contaminating the receiver. Um, one of the things that I, uh, this is uh, at WRTC in Germany this past July, and this was uh, the triplexer that we used plus the bandpass filters for 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10, and a ham plus switch that allowed uh, either of the two stations access to those five antenna systems. You'll notice it's mounted on a piece of copper plate. And, and the copper plate is not very thick. We sell these at, at DX Engineering. But there were other stations, so we used two IC7610. We had no interstation interference between the two stations, even through the triplexer. Worked perfectly. Other stations had trouble with interstation interference because they didn't have a good common point ground. This is really a critical point of station design. And we had actually mounted this. Um, I made this thing in, in Sandy's apartment two weeks before WRTC, and we had mounted everything. So all I had to do was hook up the coax cables. Notice that these are brown. Oop. These are brown coax cables. That's RG400. That's double shielded cable. And I'm going to show you why you want to use RG400 in your station today. So here's some more of those color coded ferrite cores at DX Engineering. Another thing that is really critical in your station is you want to use good quality braid or flat strap. Uh, you want good low impedance, low resistance connections. This is, uh, I use this exclusively at K3LR. It's tinned so it doesn't corrode and it's one inch wide. And I use the shortest lengths possible. Uh, this, these are the number 31, 2.4 inch toroids. I use these everywhere. I use them on line cords, DC cords, rotor cables, um, computers, uh, the AC lines going into computers. These split beads seem like a great idea. Most of the time, you can only get one or two turns around a split bead, and that's really not going to give you the kind of performance that you would like. The other thing is, there's no free lunch. When you split the bead, you don't get the same performance by winding turns through something that is split. If you have to use these, I like to use a tie wrap over them to really make sure they stay shut. The DX Engineering website is a really nice ferrite selector that allows you to, to uh, see the performance of the cores, makes it very easy. Here are uh, some of the computers at K3LR. You can see the ferrite here on a 12-volt uh, connection into the Intel Nook. This is the back end of our WRTC station in Sandy's apartment. Notice the ferrite on every cable. Every cable had ferrite on it. No interstation interference. This stuff is magic. When you do it the right way, it really works good. Here's some ISO pluses. We're going to talk a little bit about them as well. Uh, here's a receiving choke, number 31, with 27 turns of uh, small coax for receiving systems. This thing develops over 10,000 ohms of common mode impedance. Here's a great book if you've got trouble with RFI. This is a great book from the ARL, the third edition. Uh, another shot of the uh, 
the HAM Plus system, and an even better book is Ward's book on grounding and bonding. Of course, he gave a presentation earlier today. It was a packed house. If you didn't see Ward's presentation, you'll be able to see it at 1.45 today. This is, this is really good stuff. Uh, one of the things that Ward put in his book, for those of you who are having trouble with RF in the shack, is creating a ground plane underneath your radio and then bonding everything to it. This really does work. In a lot of situations, it can turn around uh, RF issues in the shack. So uh, here this summer, you'll see copper plates under every radio at K3LR. So in the book, I wanted to include a number of really good resources that are available on the internet. Sometimes if you've got hum and hiss, a good thing to have is a groundbreaker. Uh, that can be used in the audio lines. Last year, we sh I showed you some of the prototypes of the ISO Plus. Uh, we do have stock here this year. Uh, we actually, through testing, even made it better than it was last year. So th this is for Cat5, Cat6 uh, Ethernet cables in your shack and in your house. Um, for best performance, you have to put one on e either end of the Ethernet cable. I know that's a lot. Believe me, I, I've got 95 of them at K3LR. But here's, here's the performance of this thing. Look at this. All the junk that comes out of an Ethernet system, uh, you can take a look at, at the, the frequency performance here, the attenuation, and down on 160 meters, it kills it by 30 dB. So, and the great thing about this filter is it works both ways. It works on stuff coming into the Ethernet network and also what might come out of it. So it's, uh, it's really good. If you're having trouble when you transmit and you get into your Ethernet network or your cable modem, this is a great way to fix that. So the RG400, it's a 50 ohm cable. It's very flexible. It has a uh, stranded center conductor. It has two uh, silver plated shields. So it, this is what the aircraft people use when they, and the performance of this is, is striking against even popular um, cables like 400 max. If you take a look at, at the frequency performance here, the RG400, I'm sorry, versus RG213 gives you significant improvement in, uh, in shielding capabilities. So if you want to really maximize your station for SO2R, or you have a multi-operator station, and you want to have isolation, using these double shielded cables is really good. Um, and so I included some graphs in the book for um, low band performance specifically. And if you want to get even crazier, you go to Superflex, Hardline. And that's what the half-inch S-Flex is. That's Superflex. That gets you uh, even, you know, another 10 dB. But the difference of going from just RG213 to, to the double-shielded RG400 is pretty impressive. Again, a low-band presentation and uh, shield isolation. You can look through these graphs. Um, if any of you are using some of the either Hi-Z or DX Engineering or YCCC, uh, short verticals, or RG214, that's a double shielded cable. Yeah, that, that would also be very good. As, and it's very, it's even more expensive than RG400. Um, but any of you that are using receive systems that have uh, 75 ohm uh, as part of their, the cable network, look what happens between just a single shield of RG6 and the quad shield RG6 in terms of, of the shielding effectiveness. And uh, this is the low band version of that. This unit, if you're trying to fight noise or you're, you're trying to create directional patterns, I mean, I get asked, I, I was asked here this morning, you know, how do you do so well on 160 meters being on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border? It's this thing. 
I phase uh, my transmit array together with the high Z vertical array. So one is on channel A, one is on channel B, and that's what does it. It, it signals pop out of the noise when you use this box. We've also had lots of customers that have used um, the RF Pro 1B loops, two of them together, one on channel A and one on channel B, and have done very well at nulling noise. And when you null the noise, you can hear signals. So th this is a very interesting thing that I didn't quite know what was going on on the, the outside of my feed line. So we did uh, some tests in another location where we had uh, two different 200-foot-plus antenna towers, but they were pretty close to AM broadcast stations. So um, there were probably three or four that were within 10 miles. So they weren't right next door, but they were close enough. And so we made some measurements with a spectrum analyzer and a custom-made uh, current probe that we made out of splitting some toroids. And then we took a look at what was living on the outside of these hard lines. So we're going around 7 8 inch hard lines. And so here's, here's the custom probe. Um, you can see the spectrum analyzer. And if you take, and so these are before and after measurements of putting that 40, uh, those 40 beads in a choke. And take a look at all the crap that's living on the shield. So if you don't have chokes before your receiver, this is what your receiver has to deal with. And then if you put in the choke with the bead ballon, this is what you get. It really cleans things up. And what it, what it also cleans up is a lot of these second uh, harmonic and third order problems where you go uh, two times plus one. This all this trash all goes away and your receiver has a chance because this creates noise. This creates noise and anytime you create noise, it covers up signals. This is very impressive here where you see um, all those reds and that they basically go away when you put in a uh, bead choke. So it, it's, it's all there's nothing but upside here to putting chokes on both ends, one at the antenna feed point and one just before um, it goes into your receiver. In this particular case, because we were outside, we actually put the choke right at the, uh, just above the turn where the coax comes along the ground and then makes the turn to go up the tower. But the before and after measurements were very striking. So, one of the things that we talk about in here is having fun. This is a hobby, You're supposed to have fun, and also, you know, people are listening to you all the time. You know, there's a lot of SWLing going on, so you want to be a model operator. You're here at Contest University. Um, we, there's been a lot of focus on youth today. That's going to continue. Um, and make sure that you're on the air, not just during contest weekends, but get on the air and operate, and also, you know, make a commitment to teach others how to operate, even if it's going to field day. And having, you know, some fun there and teaching somebody new and lighting that contesting fire. Um, and make sure you're active in your local club. Your local club is the backbone of ham radio. So that's very important. Let's talk about a really cool new product. This is the RT4500 HD that we have been working on at DX Engineering for a long time. And it is, a, uh, it is designed to be the best rotator you will ever own. Um, it is very heavy duty, but one of the, there's some very novel things like this door here. Uh, this particular rotator, which is, it's a worm uh, drive rotator, so it doesn't have a brake. There are no limit switches inside. It depends upon the controller, which is a Green Heron controller. It's private labeled for DX engineering. But that takes care of the limits. If you want 390 degrees, if you want a little bit of overlap, this is no problem for this. If, if your uh, mass clamp slips, it's no problem to recalibrate without having to climb the tower. That's really nice. But back to this little door here. The one thing that can go wrong with some of these rotators, whether 
might be uh, the M squared Orion or a prop pitch, is the, the little reed switch in here that, that counts pulses. If you get a nearby lightning strike, that'll weld shut. And in every other rotator, you gotta take it down. That's expensive and that's a problem. If it happens on the DX engineering rotator, you pop that little door, you pull out the, the broken reed switch, you put in a new one and you're done. You're back on. So it's really nice. Uh, you can come by the booth and see this thing. It's got a heavy spline shaft. It is, uh, it's an incredible piece. We work really hard. This is the underside of it. This is the inside of the rotator. We leveraged, many of you know that DX Engineering is owned by Summit Racing Equipment. Summit Racing Equipment makes some of the best race car engines in the world. We leveraged their engineers to help us build this world-class rotator. This is the inside motor with the worm and the uh, reed switch. You can see the reed switch comes out here. Very easy to pop it in and out. It fits in Roan 25. You'll twist the top off Roan 25 before you break this rotator. <laughs> Do we have, um, can you play, there's a little uh, .avi movie on that stick. If we could play that, I, th I think I can show you the rotator in motion and it's, uh, it's really cool. Yeah, go ahead out. So come by the, uh, the booth to see this, because it's really, uh, it's very special. We have a survey that's in the bag, and I'd like you to fill out those questions and drop it off at the DX Engineering booth when you're out there tomorrow. Oh, can't play. Send feedback. Oh. All right, go back to the presentation. One of the other things that uh, we're very proud of here at Hamvention is that DX Engineering is now the exclusive North American supplier for RF kit. And, uh, oh, we got to, we, and so uh, we are, are introducing a, a new RF kit amplifier that will have FCC certification uh, later this year. And so you'll be able to buy the RF kit as RF assembled from DX Engineering in North America. Um, so this is the DX Engineering version, and this is the new RF 2K-S, capable of 1500 watts continuous duty. Um, it will produce slightly more power than that. It's built to, uh, to be very robust. It has a built-in tuner. It is uh, best in class 160 through six meter performance. So come by the uh, booth to take a look at that as well. I think there's lots of interesting stuff out at Hamvention, but I wanted to give you an, a little preview of some of the, the cool things that are going on in building one. So with that, uh, anybody have any questions? Any questions? Yes. Where's the rotator made? Where's the rotator made? In Talmadge, Ohio, USA. The, the amplifier is made in Germany. It, it, will be, uh, it will come as a kit to DX Engineering. It will be assembled and tested. Yes? From the 160 receive antennas, um, what I, I run the, the Quad Shield RG6 from the various uh, elements in the receive array. And then once I get through the combiners, I transform to 50 ohms, a little 75 ohm to 50 ohm transformer. And then I use 7 8 Heliax to come back to the shack. Yes, in the back. The, the relay? The relay, the replacement relay for what? Oh, that, that's actually a reed switch. And uh, we'll have replacements, but it's, it's not hard to find on the internet. They're, they're not very expensive. But when you don't have that, the rotor control stops and it won't allow you to rotate at all. Any other questions? Any other question? What's that? What is the cost of the amplifier? 
$4,990. The rotator, we're still working on that. Um, we don't have all the cost information in yet. I can tell you that it will be competitive. It will, it will not be uh, the price of a prop pitch or anything close to that. It will be significantly less than that. Um, we're, we want to go as low as we can. We just don't have all the costing stuff. We wanted to show it here at Hamvention so you got a preview. And we also want to get your feedback. That's very, very important to us. Yes? At maximum cable length is actually, it's, it's long. I mean, you could go probably 1,200 feet with it uh, without, we, we're selling a, uh, we will sell a number 12 wire. It takes four wires to control it. Two are motor wires and two are position wires. So it's just four wire control. Yes? Yes, if you have a long cable going from a beverage or any antenna going from uh, the feed point back to the shack, absolutely, you, I would have um, chokes on both ends. Yes, yes. Yes, the new Dash S is a pin diode It's uh, model, so it's not relays. Yeah, fourth quarter of this year will be delivery on the assembled uh, RF kits. Yes. Yes, it does have Wi-Fi connectivity. So you can have the, the amplifier someplace else, and, and that screen is available. Yes. Yes, we'll offer it as a kit and as assembled. $3,500. $4,500, I'm sorry. $4,500. $4,500. You got me. All right, in the back. Yes, the power supply is built into it. It is a 60-amp, a 50-volt power supply, and it is built in. And you could take this as carry-on luggage. It's not... What's that? How heavy? I believe uh, 35 pounds. Yes. What's that? SO2R, no, it is not SO2R capable. Um, maybe down the road it, it'll be that. One of the other nice things is it senses what the input voltage is. You plug it into 120 volts, it knows. You plug it into 240 volts, it knows. So you don't have to fool with jumpers or any of that. In the back. Yes, there's a Raspberry Pi in there, and then there is another microprocessor in there as well. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Forty. Four zero. Forty. Yes. Okay. Yes. Last question. Estimated ship date is in time for antenna season twenty twenty. We're going we're gonna to work hard to beat that. Um, when we get back, we have to go through beta testing. We're going into the lab. We're going to break it. We're going to find out where we can break it. Um, we're, when, when we publish the specs on this, it's going to be because we have lab data. So it, it's going to take us a few months to get all that together and then ramp up production. But we're going to try to get it out as soon as possible. Okay? So thanks very much. We're going to pull... You know who's, who's where now, right? You got Tamitha uh, giving her presentation from this morning over in A. In B here is Ward giving the presentation on grounding and bonding. And over to the right is USB with N6TV. And in Harding is FT4, FT8 with uh, Joel W5ZN. Enjoy the rest of your day.